Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jasper Sharp. I am the curator for modern and contemporary art at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. Uh, welcome to the third uh, in a series of four talks which we are running at Fries Masters this week. Um, the relationship between artists and museums uh, is obviously an extremely close one, an extremely complex one. The relationship between artists and historical museums is an even more interesting and complex one. And it's not surprising because it was for artists, it was for the practicing artists of the day that many of the world's great historical museums were actually founded in the first place. Uh, when the Louvre opened its doors in August 1793 for the first time, they were using the 10-day revolutionary calendar at the time. And for three days of the week, the museum was open to the public. And for the other seven days, it was reserved for artists. And this was the way with many of the great museums, the Victoria and Albert Museum here in London. And it's exactly this relationship between artists and historical museums, the great historical museums of the world that we're exploring uh, this year, again, at the Fries Masters talks. Uh, this is the second. Yesterday we had a wonderful discussion between William Kentridge, uh, the South African artist, and Dr. Ernst Wegelin, the head of the Courtauld Gallery. That was a blind date. Um, William and Ernst did not know each other, and I'm very happy to say this was another blind date. Um, Luke and Philida spent uh, a Sunday morning and a Sunday lunchtime and a Sunday afternoon together walking through the wonderful rooms and galleries of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York uh, in early September. And what we are going to hear now is a, uh, is, uh, I'm sure, very eloquent regurgitation of that walk through um, the museum. I'm going to give them the briefest of introductions. Uh, Philida uh, will be known, uh, in fact, both of these people are very well known. Philida has been working for more than four decades, making extraordinarily inventive, experimental, often very large scale installations. She's been a great influence on generations of British artists that have been coming through the art schools where she's been teaching. Uh, and until Sunday, if some of you haven't made it to the Duveen Galleries at Tate Britain, uh, you can see the wonderful installation that was commissioned by Tate, uh, made by Philida, which is up until this Sunday. And Luke Sison uh, is a curator and head of the Department of European Sculpture at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, a Brit working at the museum. Um, in an increasing, in, in a dwindling minority uh, these days. Um, Previously head of uh, Italian painting before 1500 at the Metropolitan Museum. And it's to Luke that we should be very grateful for the wonderful Leonardo da Vinci exhibition, which was at the National Gallery recently that many of you, I'm sure, saw. So Luke and Philida, over to you. <laughs> I'm going to kick off by showing eight slides of my work. I'm not going to dwell on them too long. I'm just going to give a quick overview of maybe the things that interest me and fascinate me about the hideous, dreadful, but quite obsessive and wonderful medium of sculpture <laughs> and <laughs> my extremely ambivalent relationship with it, which goes from wild love to violent hatred <laughs> in equal doses. Um, the wall and everything that the wall represents in institutions fascinates me. Is the wall the authoritarian space and the space of the floor, the space of anarchy? And I like using going between these two spaces and maybe we can unravel that a bit in the discussion. So these were large awnings that came off the wall by about five to six meters draped in brightly colored cloth. I mean, you can see probably what the work is. This is a vast um, platform ramp. I'm obsessed by the ramp as a form that um, takes over and disrupts the space and means that an audience is very much persuaded in some way to negotiate that space. But also the idea of loose building where things maybe look impermanent and fragmented as um, this is the Tate. Um, so maybe if you have been or are going, <laughs> I don't need go, to dwell go. on it too go, go. much. <laughs> um, but the generosity of the Tate in allowing me to rampage through the Devine galleries was an absolutely astounding experience for me. I, I hope it may have been for the audience, <laughs> but, um, I, I, <laughs> I, but the idea was really to try and 
generate a way of looking at sculpture that wasn't just at eye level, but involved the audience in a very physical experience. So they became, I hope, this was my idea, and maybe it wasn't the case, but I hope they would become, in a way, protagonists that were choreographed by the work as much as the work was being choreographed by the space itself, the magnificent Devine. I won't dwell on it too long. Um, so I was trying to take various sculptural postures, upright, diagonal, collapsed, fallen, broken, all, all the aspects of sculpture um, that in a way, I think in the West we've inherited through the millennia <laughs> And I was, in a way, playing with those um, particular formal concerns. Uh, this is down in Somerset, Hauser and Worth, Somerset, and um, very a completely contrasting space. Many different spaces of very different character. And I wanted to use a, a mixture of celebration and a kind of ambivalence about maybe the use of agriculture in this country and, and something about the dark underbelly of an agriculture mixed, mixed with the celebratory aspect of um, what the rural environment is and introducing contemporary work into that. Oh, yeah, and that's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I come in. Um, do you want to pass me the um, yes. thing? There we go. Um, so I really wanted Philoda to begin by showing some of her work. Um, partly because I think it, it says so much about the context of the conversation that we had when we spent all those meandering hours at the, mm -hmm. at the mat. Um, and this particular dichotomy between the ordered wall or the ordering wall and the anarchic floor was something that I was very, very interested in as we were walking around. Not least because, of course, I've come from paintings to sculpture, which meant that I was also thinking hard about, about some of these issues of, of the ways in which we, the, the works themselves demand that we view them. Um, and Philida was just the perfect companion, it turned out, to, on our blind date um, to, um, to talk about some of those things. So what we thought we'd do now is to just go through some of the pieces that we looked at Interestingly, given what we've just said, I realized um, that we didn't look at a single relief sculpture. We didn't actually really look at anything on the walls at all. Mm. Um, so we mm. were clearly drawn to the anarchic floor. Um, mm. And I think we're gonna, that's what we're going to talk about. There were various themes that came up, and I'm going to try and tease some of them out. I'm, I'm, I know they'll come up. Um, I want to say first that um, when I went to the Devine Gallery, I was just enchanted, which I don't know if it's the right thing to be, because I was so gloriously confused in Philida's work by issues of monumentality versus transience, of lightness versus solidity, of, of danger versus um, a sense of order. And, and all these things came up. And they came up again, I think, when we were talking about the works um, mm. in, in, at the Met. Um, the way in which um, sculptors might seek to control viewing with objects that actually are rather difficult to control. There's no, there's no frame, there's no, there's no set process for looking at, at, at three-dimensional works. That whole question of whether just something that's three-dimensional is automatically sculptural was a question that we mm. talked about, or whether, whether sometimes sculptors panic and make things that are, are pictorial or, mm. or illustrative. Um, we talked a bit about um, the issues of, we talked a lot about materials, as you'll see, um, important to Philida, important to me, not least because um, in museum terms, sculpture is usually seen as being marble or wood or, um, or bronze. And um, the, so the ceramic pieces, for example, at the Met are looked after very firmly by the ceramics curator um, and were banished recently from a, a show by a contemporary photographer who thought they were kitsch. So, you know, that's, a, that's what, something that I also wanted to, we'll get to at the end. And then I think that the bit that was really, really intriguing for me was an, an issue that if, if, paintings, um, if paintings ask you to accept that you're looking to some degree through a, a framed um, window onto something else, 
a sort of suspension of, of disbelief, if you like, that sense of moving into another space, then sculptures share our space and have a kind of palpable reality. So we talked a lot about the suspension of, of belief as opposed to the suspension of disbelief and how that plays out in, in sculpture. So we'll talk about um, all of these things, I hope, or some of them at least, as we, as we move through these images. I think it's worth saying straight away that, of course, the really sad thing about looking at a slideshow of sculpture mm -hmm. is that you lose those three dimensions straight away. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you're going to have to come to the mat and do the same tour that we did. Even, and I might volunteer to be there, if you're lucky. Um, the, um, mm -hmm. So what we're looking at now is um, a piece of sculpture by... Um, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, possibly still working um, with his father and under his father's umbrella. Um, a sculptor who, at the very beginning of his career, is deeply conscious of what it is to be a sculptor, who's, who's worrying about it a, a great deal. We know that he was still in his possession, Gian Lorenzo Bernini's possession, when he died. So there was some, some importance to this work that we, we don't quite understand. The context for it probably would have been something like a, a garden, but it was never shown in a garden. There's no sign of where. Um, and so what we have is a piece that, um, that still insists on um, the notion of the, of the block, but I think it's a young sculptor who's really pushing at the, the medium. Mm. And we're not sure quite how successfully. Mm. Yes, I, I, I love it because I think when you're in its presence and walking round it, it's incredibly awkward. His, his back is somehow stunted. It's as though he ran out of stone. And I, I like that fact that the block controls something about how to manage the forms within it. And that the, the ambition for the piece kind of outwits the control that the block had on it. So there's this these twisted forms, which of course was the great thing about, I think, sculpture of this mm. whole several decades, was this discovery of the twisted form or the using of the twisted form as a way, I think, of both creating that absolute three-dimensionality, that sculptural dynamic and very theatrical. So at any one moment, you're seeing more than one side of the figure. And yet you're never mm. quite seeing enough. I mean, that's no, what's so fascinating yeah. about this piece. So if you, if you look at this figure here, yes. you, know, you actually don't really quite understand what's happening behind. So mm. he forces you on this, this journey ar around, around the piece, using a kind of anarchic subject matter in order to, to fight against the order of this block in an odd sort of way. There's a, there's a, there's a, real, um, there's a real balancing act between his sense of showing how how good he is as a young sculptor. Mm. I mean, even technically, you know, just making this thing stack up through the, lo the load bearing of the stone, um, mm. and, then, um, and then using this extraordinary kind of lunging, drunken gesture of the foot. It's probably easier to see on the other side. Mm. Try doing that without doing some yourself some <laughs> severe injury. Um, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of gesture that you make when you're, ap you know, you're absolutely sozzled when, and young, um, I should say. Um, and, um, and, and, the, and it's full of that kind of, of, of that sort of, you know, that... But that, I think that, what is, teetering. for me, interesting, that the, the tree, which is this well-known device mm. for holding something up, it's the armature, um, is almost, in my opinion, too big for... It's as though that refined skill mm -hmm. hasn't mm -hmm. quite kicked in yet. You know, the, the relationships of the figures to the things that are actually technically doing an enormous job of work isn't quite in balance, in harmony yet with this. But what I really think is incredible, the whole idea of the hole in the sculpture, mm -hmm. puncturing the sculpture, you know, the Barbara Hepworth, Henry Moore, mm. et cetera, et cetera, so that you let the air in from yeah. the other side yeah. of the yeah. sculpture. I mean, this is doing exactly that. It's giving this thing the, the air and the space is actually a material in its own right. 